So we have been doing this series called Freedom Reigns. God wants you to live in freedom. God wants you to live in his liberty. We're going to look at a passage of scripture, um, but I, I want to say that the message today is going to hone in on addiction. So we're going to be looking at freedom from addiction. Now I want to say this, some of you might say, oh, well, I'm not addicted to anything. Um, well, you might be quite surprised because I think that we all struggle with addictions in one form or another. And if you're here and you're saying that there might be some of the stuff that's spoken about today, you say, oh, well, that doesn't relate to me. It's not just about us living in freedom. It's also about us helping other people to live in freedom as well. So, so we are blessed, but we're also here to be a blessing to other people, to lead other people into freedom as well. Let's have a look at our passage of scripture for today. This is in John 8, and we're going to go from verse 31 to 36, and it says this, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free... You shall be free indeed. So I want to I want to highlight a few things from this passage of scripture. First of all, being a disciple of Jesus, it's not just about believing in him, but it's also about abiding in his word. So what does it mean to abide in God's word? It means to remain. It means to continue. It means to tarry. It's very important for us as believers to know what God says in his word. And when we get a revelation about what God says in his word, it leads us into a greater experience of freedom. Now, in this passage of Scripture, it's very interesting that the Jewish listeners here were basically saying, we've never been a slave to anyone. But if you know your biblical history, you will know that the Jewish people were slaves in Egypt for, for over 400 years. So it, it sounds like it's suggesting that there's a little bit of denial going on here. And often this is us. This is you. This is me. We claim we've never been bound or held captive to anything, yet often there are patterns that permeate our past. Sin always seeks to enslave us and to hold us captive. Often we're told in this day and age, in this world, if it feels good, do it as if there's no consequence, but there's always a consequence to sin. It always restricts and holds us captive, it enslaves us. But our true identity as children of God is not slavery, but we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Our identity in Christ is freedom. If you have surrendered your life, to Christ, if you've put your faith and trust in him, then you are free. You are free in Christ. But the reality is that we don't always live out of that freedom or from that place of freedom. Sometimes we fall into addictive behaviors that hold us back from walking in the fullness of all that God has for us. We don't live in alignment with the truth about what God says about who we are. I want to share a few, you know, of my own personal struggles because the reality is everyone in this room and everyone watching online has struggles. And if you, if you are here and you say, I don't have any struggles, 
well, can I say to you that, well, it's obviously, there's one that's obvious, is that lying is obviously an issue. <laughs> we all have struggles. Now, some of us may conceal it and hide it better than others, but we've all got stuff that we're working through. I've shared this uh, with you guys as a church before, but as a youngster, I really battled a lot with an addiction to computer games. And you might say, like, oh, that sounds like really silly or trivial. But actually, it, it, was, it was a vice that really robbed me of a lot in my life. It robbed me, actually, of fulfilling my full potential at school, at college, because I was so addicted to computer games. The reality is that, that, that entertainment had become a bit of a god in my life. There was an element of escapism where I was going into a virtual world that wasn't real and it had no eternal benefit at all. And I realized, wow, you know, I could brag to my friends at school about how good I was on Football Manager or, you know, Red Alert or Civilization or one of the games that I used to play. But the reality is it had no eternal value. It wasn't enhancing or enriching my life. And the reality is you can get really good at a computer game that's just come out and then suddenly other new games come out and suddenly people are like, oh, like you're good at that, but you need to be good at this new one. And so you can never keep up. But I found myself that computer games were robbing me of walking in the fullness of all that God had for me. And I remember when I went to university and, you know, started to study for a degree. And, and, and I knew I cannot, you know, I was, had a busy life. You know, I mean, we've all got busy lives, haven't we? We've all got stuff going on. But, you know, I was married. You know, I had lots of responsibilities, very involved in church. I'm studying as well. And, and I just thought to myself, you can't do this anymore. So I remember taking my favorite computer game, Football Manager, and putting it on Amazon for sale. And the day I sold that game, I cried. <laughs> no, I didn't cry, really. But, but it was an important decision that I needed to make because I knew you either want your degree or you want to just continue playing these stupid computer games. Now, let me just say, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with computer games, although some of them I would say we do need to have wisdom and discernment about, because not all computer games are good. There's some pretty uh, disgusting games out there. So it's, God's not against us having fun and enjoyment, but he is against it when it gets a hold of our life, when it becomes like a vice, a grip that robs us from walking in freedom. And I would easily be able to go like 24 hours playing computer games. Like, no problem. If I really got into a game, you know, I'd maybe just get up to, to spend a penny, you know, grab a bite to eat, but then I'd be back on the games. And that's how obsessive it was for me. But thank God for his grace. Thank God that he is able to break every chain. And I, I can honestly say computer games no longer have a hold on my life. You know, other areas that I've struggled in my life, I've struggled uh, around um, sugar. Anyone else struggle with sugar? I mean, they say, don't they, sugar is more addictive than cocaine. And, and, you know, so, you know, it's an area that actually has a very negative impact. When you're having lots of refined sugar, it will affect your health. And so we have to be careful. And I want to encourage you, you know, when you're buying stuff from the shops, don't just consume it because it tastes nice. Look on the labels. I believe that God wants us to be wise stewards of our bodies. He wants us to, to live a healthy and long life. But we need to, to make wise decisions about what we consume. But sugar has been an issue. And it's something that even to this day I have to watch. And again, I'm not saying God's against sugar. But when it becomes an addiction, when it starts to affect our health in a negative way, then obviously there needs to be changes. I've also battled with being a bit of a workaholic, sometimes getting very obsessed and consumed in my work. And the reality is I love what I do, and it doesn't feel like work. 
And so that makes it more difficult. I've also battled uh, in, in my life, and I know there's many other people in the room that struggle as well, with this. Anyone else be real and say, I sometimes struggle with this as well. We're on our phones, we're texting, we're emailing, we're you know, on social media or whatever. And again, it's not to say that phones are wrong. Phones can be used to do some really amazing stuff. Sometimes I even write my sermon on this phone. But the reality is that when it becomes a vice of addiction, when it becomes obsessive, it becomes a problem. You know, it's very sad sometimes, you know, you'll go into a restaurant and you see a family and they're all sat around, you know, their meal and they're all like this looking on their phone. And they're like, come on, guys, like talk to one another. Go old school. <laughs> Have a conversation, a proper conversation. So we have to watch these things, and these are things that I even have to watch. I want to share one more thing. This is from my past. Can you guys handle me confessing something, uh, and, and you're not going to judge me for it? Is that okay? Okay. When I was 11 years of age, I'd been in secondary school maybe a couple of weeks. I'd made some new friends. It was break time, uh, we, were, we were just on a break between lessons, and one of my new friends, he comes up to me, he puts a magazine right in my face and he says, Dan, Daniel, look at the pair on her. I'm, I'm, John's saying, don't look at me. No. Hey, guys, we've got to be real. We need to be real because sometimes when we start being real, oh, you can't talk about that in church. The reality is I was 11 years of age and I was introduced into pornography. All of my friends were into it. There wasn't a one of my friends that wasn't into pornography. They had the magazines, they had the videos, they would look on the sites. There was a lot of addiction with my friendship circle around pornography. And so I, was, I wasn't, you know, I was brought up in a good Christian home. I wasn't, you know, seeking after any of that sort of stuff. And yet I found myself on a daily basis being exposed to all of this pornographic material. And I'll be honest, that even though I wasn't seeking after it, sometimes there's that curiosity where, you, you know, you may say, oh, have a look at this. And you're like, oh, like, and you've not seen that before. And there's that kind of shock factor element. And as a teenager, I struggled around that area of, of pornography. It was something that, that I, I battled with. And some of you might be shocked at that. But the reality is, let me be really real with you. I was 11. Nowadays, children get exposed to that stuff much earlier. And, and it's not just pornography. We're talking explicit stuff, high-level violent stuff. You know, all sorts of, like, gross Evil stuff is, you know, our children are being exposed to. So that's something that I really had to, to work through. I had to deal with, you know, I remember going around my mate's house and I was just there, you know, to play computer games and, you know, just to chat and, you know, hang out. And, and he had a movie going on in the background. And it wasn't like in my place where I would say, I'll oh, turn it off. They knew I was a Christian. You know, my friends knew I was a Christian, but it was really, really difficult trying to live pure and holy when it was constantly being surrounded with that. But, you know, being honest, there were times where I made poor choices as a youngster, where I'd say, hey, take that magazine, and, I, and I'll take the magazine. And then I'd have to carry all those images and stuff, and it was unhealthy, and it was unhelpful. But thank God for his grace. Thank God for his grace. You know where that was? I was 11 years of age, and I really struggled over uh, the four years were a particular struggle for me. But do you know when everything changed for me? It was when I had a prophetic word over my life, when I was prayed for in a, me in a meeting by a Nigerian prince. That was when my life transformed. I had a prophetic word over my life about the calling the purpose that God had for my life to make an eternal difference. And I knew, I knew it, 
in a sense, what, what God was saying, it's time to grow up. It's time to stop messing around with that stuff that has no eternal value for you at all. And I knew, I knew that I had a choice of whether I went down this unrighteous path that led to destruction or whether I chose to go down the righteous path that would lead to the abundant life. And I knew that with the calling that I was being presented, God saying, come on, I'm calling you up to a higher level. I knew that I couldn't lead a double lifestyle anymore and that pornography had to go. And I want to say this, when you get a vision for your life, it's one of the most powerful things for helping you stay on the right track. I remember being uh, uh, in a meeting where the preacher, preacher said, never exchange long-term goals for short-term pleasures. And that stuck with me. I thought, yeah, like, don't, don't throw it all away just for some short-term pleasures. Have a big vision. Have a big dream. Focus on what God has called you to do. Now, let me just put it out there and say, pornography is not an issue for me. So don't worry and think, oh, no, our pastor struggles with it. Like, God delivered me of that. Praise God that I'm out of that mess. But I still have to keep my shield up. And, you know, it doesn't matter how strong you might say you are as a Christian, how much of the Bible you know, we still have to be wise. We still have to be on guard. We still have to defend ourselves against the temptations of the enemy. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. Some of you would say, oh, I never ever would be, you know, tempted by, you know, pornography. But maybe for you it's food. Maybe for you it's gossip. Maybe for you it's gambling. Maybe for you it's anger. Maybe for you it's pride. Maybe for you it's materialism. Maybe for you it's work. Maybe for you it's sugar. But we all have areas where the enemy will try and tempt us. And it's important to know that, that being tempted isn't the sin. It's when you lean into that temptation and you meditate and you act on it. Because remember, even Jesus was tempted. Even Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. But he did not give in to those temptations. And I really do believe that for us as a church, we need to be a people where it's okay for people to be real. Because in some churches, if you're to talk about, you know, the major temptations, there's three major temptations, money, sex, and power. And in some churches, if you talk about it, they're like, you know, oh, no, 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 we can't talk about that here. You know, it's not the place. If people are shut down where they can't be real in church, they'll be real outside of church. And the reality is they're going to get a lot of advice and a lot of it is not going to be helpful. So we need to take away the shame and the stigma around this stuff and say it's okay to be real in church. It's okay. And to recognize that we, we are all in need of a saviour. We all need his help. We all need his grace. And you know what? We're going to, there's a lot of stories I know even in this room and, and that will be watching online. Some amazing testimonies that God wants to unearth. And I believe that we're going to be hearing a lot of, uh, you know, stories of people coming in. And some of you are going to be shocked at what you hear. But God is a gracious God. God's the God of a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. He's a gracious God. So let's have a look at five steps to walking in freedom from addiction. Number one, first you have to admit you have a problem. This is the first step, admitting I've got a problem. You admit to yourself, first of all. Secondly, you admit to God that you have a problem. So this is the first step. Don't be like the, the people in this passage who say, we were never in bondage, we were never in slavery. It's like, hello, you were slaves for over 400 years. 
You have a heritage of slavery. That's deeply ingrained in your people. That was your experience. Don't live in denial. Don't try and flower it up or dress it up with this religious language. Say it as it is. You've got a problem. Admit to yourself, I've got a problem. And that's the first step. You know, they talk about this in the 12-step program, in the Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. And I remember as a, uh, you know, in my earlier Christian years that the Lord asked me to, to ask a, a guy who lived most of his life as an alcoholic to take me through the 12 steps of AA. And I remember at the time saying, God, I've never had a problem with drinking drugs. And yet I felt like the Lord say, no, but you've got other issues in your life that I want to deal with. And you need to humble yourself and you need to learn. And I remember going to this guy, I remember going to this guy, many of you remember Dale Fletcher, he's now in heaven, he's now in glory. But I remember going to Dale, and he was quite new in the church, and remember, I'm his pastor, he's one of the congregation. And so I say, hey Dale, will you take me through the 12 steps of AA, will you be my sponsor? And he just lit up, he was like, oh, I'd love to. That'd be amazing. I remember he came the next week, and he had the, the, the AA book, the big book, and and we would meet once a week for breakfast. And I used to joke and say that he was like my counselor. But God, in a lot of those sessions, I would just sit there and I would just cry as God was peeling back the layers. Because often, you know, we can get into using all this religious language. We flower things up. We skate around things and we avoid the issues in our life. But I found that God started to bring healing in my life. But I knew it wasn't just about freedom for me. It was also about freedom for other people. God was teaching me even about a life that I had not lived. And in that situation, I found myself that as he was helping me to walk in some deeper freedom, he started to ask me about Jesus. He started to ask me about the Bible. And so it was amazing how that me being in that position, yeah, he was helping me. But I began to disciple him as well. And it was a mutual blessing, an iron sharpening iron situation. So number one, admit you have a problem. Number two, confess to someone else and seek help. Confess to someone else and seek help. James 5.16 says this, confess your sins to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. Some people want the healing, but they don't want the confession bit. But we see they're linked. They are linked. If you want to walk in greater freedom and healing, you've got to have that humility and courage to confess your sins. Another translation says, confess your faults. We sung about it today, about our weaknesses. This is, one of the, this is one of the phrases that they use in the 12-step program. You're only as sick as your secrets. You're only as sick as your secrets. The moment that you confess your sin, your shortcomings, your weakness to someone else, you disempower the lie. You disempower the lie. You've heard me share this uh, before, but, you know, in the garden, you know, if you've had a flower pot that's been sat there for a long time, you know, you lift up the flower pot, you know, it's a sunny day, the sun shines on that spot, and what happens? All of the bugs scurry away. This is the power of confession. When you confess your sin... All the bugs scurry away. You disempower the lie. You disempower the lie. So when we confess, this is part of us following the path towards healing and wholeness. Now, I'm not saying just confess your, your sins to everyone. I'm not saying that. We still need wisdom. We still need discernment. But... I believe that we should all at least have at least one person that you can be completely real with about your struggles. 
whatever that looks like, and it's going to be different in this room, different struggles that we're going to struggle, different those that are, you know, online. We're all going to have different struggles. And it's not about, you know, comparing and saying, oh, Adam, like, yours is worse than mine. No, it's not about that. It's about recognizing, no, we are all, we all have our issues and our areas of struggle, but we recognize that we need help. We need help from God. We need help from one another. Many people are reluctant to confess because of a fear of rejection or judgment. And, and you know, even with me sharing that testimony about me as an 11-year-old, I felt like my first kind of spiritual kind of instinct was, part, as a pastor, if you're not real with them, they won't be real with you. That was my kind of initial, like, you need to share this. But you know what the second voice said? The second voice was, if you tell them about that, some people will judge and criticize you. And that's the voice of religion. That's the voice of the Pharisees, who were ultra critical of everyone else, and yet they had much, much bigger issues going on. You know, we can be like the person who wants to remove the speck in our brother's eye, when we have Noah's Ark in our own eye. we got much bigger stuff going on. And I find, this is my experience, I become most critical and judgmental when I am most not following what God wants me to do. It's in those times that I become more critical. When I'm busy doing what God wants me to do, following his path, I'm too busy to criticize and point the finger what everyone else is doing. Because I'm busy following God's plan and his purpose. I haven't got time to mess around with, with, you know, putting everyone else under the lens. And when we're following that righteous path, we're most at peace. Remember, you're only as sick as your secrets. Let's be a church that we have a culture of authenticity where it's safe to be real. That if I share something, it's not a case of, oh, I can't talk to you anymore. What a bad you know, person you are. No, we need to have a, a culture of authenticity where it's okay to be real. And where, where our heart as a church and as a community is we want to love people and we want to help lead them into freedom and restoration. This is not about winking at sin. It's not about saying sin's okay. It's not about sweeping it all under the carpet. It's not about that. When Jesus encountered the woman who was, you know, caught in adultery and, you know, she was dragged out into, into the public, you know, With not much on, what did the religious leaders want to do in that moment? They wanted to stone her. Because that was what the law said. Have you ever thought about, well, what about the bloke? What about his part in it? And those religious leaders who dragged her out, well, hang on, is that right? Well, there was pornography going on there, wasn't there? They wanted to stone her, and that's the voice of religion. The voice of religion wants to stone people and punish. But Jesus, with his grace and with his truth, yes, he challenged the woman. Yes, he said, you know, go and sin no more. But he didn't judge and condemn. He, He stooped down to lift her up and say, hey, why are you doing this to yourself? You deserve so much more. I have created you. You're my daughter. I've got the best for you. He wanted to lift her up higher. I don't condemn you. He said, go and sin no more. Let's let's be a church that we're like that. That we're not seeking to pick up the stones and tell people how, what a disgrace they are. But let's be people that we're stooping down to pick people up and say, Come on, God's calling you up to a higher level.
point number three. There is, know that there is no chain that God cannot break. Freedom is part of your inheritance. If you are a follower of Christ, if you're part of his family, freedom's part of your inheritance. And if you're here today or you're watching online and you haven't received Christ into your life, let today be the day. Today is the day of salvation. And the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Freedom is part of our inheritance. But often, we do have to contend for what belongs to us. And we have to partner with the Lord in obedience. But know this, some of you might be sitting here or watching online, you may be thinking, oh, Pastor, if you knew what I was struggling with. I want you to be encouraged today. We sang about it earlier on, about all things are possible with God. Some of you are involved in some stuff and you're thinking, I'll never be able to break out of this. And I want you to know, all things are possible with God. There's no chain that he cannot break. Point number four. Immerse yourself in the truth. Immerse yourself in the truth. When we come to Christ and we give him our lives, we become born again. We become what the Bible says is a new creation. Our spirit is one with him. But whilst we have a brand new spirit, that that part is renewed, there's still two other parts of us that are not renewed. And that is our body and our soul. So this flesh doesn't become new. You don't get a new body. You've still got to take responsibility for sorting that part of, of yourself out. We are triune beings. We are spirit, soul, and body. And our soul is our thinking, our choosing, and our feeling. It's our mind, our will, and our emotions. That part, we have to take responsibility for sorting out. That's why the Bible says, you know, don't copy the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, by changing the way that you think. This is our responsibility. God's going to not force you to read his word, but there's something. He's given us his word. He's given us the medicine. He's given us the tools to deal with the weeds and the thorns and the thistles in the garden of our life. Immerse yourself in the truth. We read about it, didn't we, in John 8 earlier on. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So there's something about when you know something that leads you into greater freedom. So let's be people that immerse ourselves in the truth. That we read the Bible, we read God's word, we let it read us. We meditate on it, we confess it, we pray it, we di discuss it, we share it, we live it. Now imagine that suddenly you find out, you receive a letter through the post. It's a very official looking envelope. You open it up and there's a letter inside that says that a long lost relative who was very wealthy has passed away. And he has left you his entire estate. Think about how you would feel in that moment. How many of you might be a little bit excited? <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> so you're told about this inheritance, but it's not just enough to know that you've got an inheritance. You have to claim it. So there are steps to take to claim your inheritance. That's in the natural, and so it is in the natural, so often it is in the spiritual as well. So the first thing is, yes, you have to claim it, but also I'm sure that you're going to be thinking, well, what's in that will then? So I've got an inheritance, there's an estate. So, so I want to know, like, what estate are we talking about here? W what possessions are we on about here? You're going to want to know what's in the will. Well, it's the same for us as Christians that we've been given a will, we've been given God's word, but unless you know what's written in it, you don't know what belongs to you. 
So we need to be people to know what belongs to us, what, what Jesus has died for, what Jesus has, has brought for you and for me. Know what is in his word. It's important that we know about who we are in Christ because we live in a day and age that questions identity and makes people question who they are. There's a lot of deception that goes on. And what matters is knowing what God says about you. It's not about what the world says about you. It's not about what you even think or feel. It's about what God says. Your creator, it's what his opinion is that what matters most. And there's a lot of nonsense that goes on in the world, isn't it? I, you know, some, someone who was, you know, declaring that I identify as a piece of broccoli. You're like, are you for real? You're a human being. But this is the nonsense that we hear in our world. And this is why it's important that you know the truth. Because when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Know who you are in Christ. In Christ, you are accepted. You are chosen. You are loved. You are called. You are forgiven. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. This is the truth. This is what the Bible says about you and it says about me. We also need to know about who God is. God is loving. He is gracious. He is just. He is merciful. He is faithful. We read about these things when we read his will, when we read the Bible. Came across this really great post that was showing the difference between the voice of religion, which is all about performance and going through the rituals and empty motions, but there's no real heart versus having relationship with God. It's, it's two very different things, okay? And this is what this post said. Two responses. A guy who's messed up. He's made a mistake. Okay? This is what religion says. Religion says, I've messed up. Dad's going to kill me. But relationship says, I've messed up. I need to call my dad. <laughs> this is the difference between law and grace. One is motivated by fear. And one is motivated by faith and love. Here's the final point. Keep short accounts. Keep short accounts. Right? Don't leave things to fester and build up. Keep short accounts. Be quick to confess. Be quick to deal with your sins. Be quick to seek help. Don't hide in the dark. Walk in the light. Keep short accounts. That's why it says in the Bible, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Okay, make sure that you bring it before the Lord. Because when you leave stuff, it will only fester and grow and build up. Sometimes we need to have that courage to have the crucial conversation. Where we can be real with ourselves, but we can also be real with others as well. I want to give an opportunity for people to respond. And I want each and every one of you to know that God is a loving and gracious God. But I felt like that there were many people here today and watching online that, that it was like God giving an invitation. Do you want to be free? So I felt like that the significant step for many of us today, is about being honest. And so I want to give you an opportunity to be honest. I want to give you an opportunity to apply what we looked at in James 5, 16, about confess your faults to one another, pray for one another, that you might be healed. And I believe God wants to bring healing. And I really even sense that there was people that... When you are honest, when you choose that, have that courage, that humility, so I'm going to be honest, it's going to unlock some stuff of healing in your life, physically, 
Some of you have had some physical ailments, some physical stuff that you've been going through. But through confession, that honesty actually is going to be a release of healing in your life. And I also saw it mentally that there was some mental stuff, some maybe some stuff that was going on with your thoughts through offloading, casting that weight, casting that burden at the foot of the cross, giving it to Jesus, recognizing I need some help. I really felt like that there was going to be a peace that was going to flow in. So I want to give you an opportunity just in this moment, just in this holy moment, for us just to be real with God. In a short moment, there will be the prayer ministry team down the front, maybe if with some of the E3 leaders that are willing to come forward to the front as well. And if you want to respond by saying, yeah, I want to be able to go to someone to share something, and let me just say that anything you share with these guys will be in confidence, unless it's something that the, the police need to be alerted of. And I'm just being really honest and real, because sometimes those things do come out. There is that confidentiality. But I really do believe that as we act on the word of God, as we respond to whatever Holy Spirit is saying to us today, I believe that there is freedom that's going to be released. Some of you are going to walk out this place feeling like a new person, with real peace, real joy, feeling like, oh, I no longer have to carry that that sickness anymore. So let me just pray for you. Should we stand to our feet just in, in this response? And then I'm just, I'm just going to ask, like, once I pray, if you feel Holy Spirit is saying to come down to the front about whatever it is, no one's going to think, oh, they're going up the front. <laughs> oh, did you see? Where, oh, that, that John Joss was quick to get down the front, wasn't he? No one's going to think that because, hey, I'm, I'm first to say, here I am, Lord. I haven't got it together. I need help as well. So let's pray. And then I'm going to give you an opportunity that if you want to, you don't have to. I don't want anyone to feel pressure or feel coerced. Only if you feel, if you feel Holy Spirit is giving you a nudge, come to the front. Talk to one of the prayer ministry team. Seek some prayer, you can do that. And you don't have to do that. You might want to talk to someone during the coffee time. You might want to come and chat with me and Laurel or someone who brought you to church. You might want to jump into the chat and say, hey, can I chat with someone? I really feel this message is ministered to me. We want you to know that there's a, there's a place of freedom and that there's no judgment, there's no guilt, there's no shame. We just want you to know God loves you and he wants you to walk in his freedom. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for your message today. We thank you that you are a God of freedom. We thank you that you did not design us to be people that were in slavery or captive in any way to live our lives bound. But you came to set the captives free. And Father, I thank you that, Lord God, not only have you come to set us free, Lord God, but you've called us to liberate other people, to lead them into freedom. So, Father God, we pray that we will know the truth, that we will know you. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life, Jesus. And so we pray that we will, we will come to know you more closely, that we would know your word more, that you would help us to renew our, our thinking, that, Lord, where there's stinking thinking that needs to be dealt with, Lord, we pray that you would clean and clear it up, Lord Jesus. And Father, I pray that you'd give us courage to be honest. Give us courage to be authentic. That we will not try and just, you know, be fake or put on a mask and, you know, pretend that everything's okay and we don't have any struggles. But Lord, that we have that courage to be real. Yes, Lord, we want wisdom and discernment as well to know the right people to go to where we can seek help. And Lord, ultimately, Lord, we recognize that ultimately... Our help comes from you, the maker of heaven and earth. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us and highlight by your Holy Spirit, highlight any areas of our lives where there's dysfunction, where there's brokenness, where there's issues, where there's sin, where there's harmful addictions. Lord, shine your light on those areas. Break off all deception, Lord Jesus. 
Help us to not only walk in the light, but to live in the light. And Lord God, I pray right now, we pray for, for City Life Church, that we would be a place of honesty, that we would be a haven for healing, for wholeness, and we thank you that, Lord, whatever the enemy meant for harm, God, you can turn into something good. So I thank you, and I just have a real sense in my spirit that there's some stuff that you guys have been battling with that actually there's a, an excitement in the spirit because God is wanting to use your mess to become a powerful message of hope and healing for others. That God wants to use your story of deliverance to encourage and inspire other people where you will be able to say, yeah, I struggled in that area, but God set me free. And if he did it for me, he can do it for you. So, Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would give vision and dreams, Lord, to your people. How that, Lord, that you want, you want to give them your beauty in exchange for the ashes. So, Lord, we just pray all of these things, Lord, in your holy and precious name, Jesus. And all God's people in agreement said, Amen. Amen. Why don't we give the Lord a hand clap?